Hey, welcome into the Fearless Investor Podcast. I'm Kyle Stanley, and you're checking us out either on our podcast or our YouTube channel. And right now, I want to make sure that you are using Price Labs in your business. If you're not using Price Labs, I'm telling you, you are losing out on money and you're spending probably a lot more time in your business. I've tried out a lot of different dynamic pricing tools. Price Labs is the best out there for a couple of reasons. One, it's the most affordable. They're going to charge you per listing. They're not going to take a bunch of your money that you're making because they're taking a percentage. They're taking just a little bit by each listing. And number two, it's going to dynamically price every single day in your portfolio that you have listed. That means that if you don't know that there's a day that is either high demand or low demand because of supply and demand factors, you're priced at the right price to be competitive with your market. So how do you even know if you're not using something like Price Labs if you're priced correctly? You really don't. You're shooting in the dark. And what about those holidays that you forget and maybe even rodeos or those festivals that you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot that was happening this year. And you missed out on hundreds of dollars per night that you could have been charging. Price Labs is taking care of all that for you. All you got to do, if you're listening on our podcast, go to the show notes of this one, which is going to be www.fearlesskyle.com forward slash Stephen Potaski. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Petaskey is P-E-T-A-S-K-Y. And we're going to have the Price Labs right there link that you can go ahead and sign up with and you can get started with a free 30-day trial. And you can also uh, check out a tutorial that the Price Labs CEO is going to get you. You can do that on the show notes or if you're watching on the YouTube channel, just right down below and you can click on that link to get, again, that free 30-day trial and that tutorial. Now with Steven today, what I'm really excited about is this guy has an incredible background in STRs. He started before Airbnb was even around. He's been in it for 15 years. And he was building up equity partners in these properties before there was anything such as co-hosting or arbitrage. And so he has an incredible wealth of knowledge and he's going to teach us really how to be able to get our first one and how to really what to know about buying your first vacation rental. So let's get to it right now with Stephen Potaski of the Luxus Group. Awesome. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Kyle Stanley here. And uh, welcome in Airbnb Masterminders. For those of you that are watching live right now, and for those of you that maybe you're watching two weeks later, um, well, you <laughs> missed it live, but we are back here with Stephen Potaski with the Lexus, or sorry, the Luxus, not to be confused with the Lexus group. <laughs> we <laughs> even went over that before we started. And I still, so close. <laughs> still said Lexus, uh, man, just used to it. My, my wife's got a Lexus. So I'm sorry. We say it all the time in this family. Oh, good. It's, it's a good uh, <laughs> mistake to make. It represents luxury. So I'm okay yeah. with that. There you go. There you go. Well, hey, Stephen, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Where are you coming from today? Uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where I'm right now in our, our head office. And then, um, yeah, Western Canada, the snow's melting. So it's getting better outside. Spring's around the corner. Nice. And I'm really excited about this conversation today uh, because... You were in Airbnb. Well, you sorry, you were in short-term rentals before Airbnb. And so we've got a lot of knowledge coming from you before the Airbnb world even started. Uh, but Stephen, before we get started, of course, we got to ask, what is that craziest short-term rental story that you have uh, in all the years that you've been doing this? Uh, you know what? I had to think about that one. We've probably had you know, 40,000 guest experiences through kind of our various networks of uh, properties and funds and Airbnbs. And I had to think of one, but the, probably the, the, it was a good one, but it was, a, it was a hard one. It was a good outcome. But I got a call from was a friend of mine at one of our properties in Palm Springs at uh, five in the morning. And there was you know, several rings. And I, uh, I got the call in the last one. I'm like, wait, what's he calling me for? And um, it's like, Oh, hey, Steve, uh, are, you, are you awake? I'm like, no, but I, I am now. He goes, I'm sorry, but we burnt the house down. And uh, it was like, oh, no. Like, first off, which house? We had five, I think, in the area at the time. So I had to clarify. And then um, oh, no. when he shared, it was, you know, certainly a beautiful house, kind of $1.5 million, you know, beautiful home. And uh, you could tell he was just shaking, even sharing the news. I mean, you feel absolutely awful. Totally not his fault bad set of circumstances, bad timing, outdoor fire pit, caught one little piece of wood at like two in the morning. And then it kind of transferred in the house and then the oh. house effectively, we lost half of it, but we had to basically rebuild the entire thing. We probably cost us a $1.1 million insurance claim or so. Anyway, that was a really big test on a lot of things, both on, you know, our safety protocols, everyone was safe, thank goodness. 
and our insurance protocols, which fortunately we did have, which is a very good tip, you know, short-term rental insurance is different than residential insurance yeah. to make sure you're, uh, you're well covered in such an eventuality. So that was the, uh, that was probably the toughest story of the bunch. Um, there's lots of unique ones along the way, but that one kind of hit home the most. So what you're saying is the absolute biggest, worst thing happened that could have happened. Everyone fears that house burning down and, and everything got covered and everything was good. The worst yes. happened to you. And now, I mean, if, you, if you're still doing it and the worst has happened to you, then I guess yeah. the worst isn't as bad as we think. It's true. And maybe good, quick hot tip before we get on lots of things, but we built in unknowing at the time been doing this for 15 years, like a business interruption policy so that we could actually rent another home. So our clients could continue to vacation for the year it took to effectively you know, rebuild and remodel the home. So a lot of people wouldn't have that built in, you'll effectively lose all that revenue. So um, I, I give kudos to the predecessor of my accounting department for setting that up a decade ago, but um, to because it worked. So thanks. Very, very grateful. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, well, hey, I, I'm seeing people jump on to this live video now. What's going on, Ray? Thanks for commenting. And if you are watching us live right now, make sure you are posting your questions. As you post questions, we're going to ask your questions to Stephen, who has over 15 years of experience in the short-term rental industry. You want to learn from someone today. Stephen is your guy. And uh, again, we are uh, coming here live on the Airbnb Masterminds page. If you're watching this on replay later, uh, what are you waiting for? You've got to get in on the Airbnb Masterminds page. We're the biggest in the world now and growing and want to just keep on bringing you as much value as possible. So today, Stephen is the guy to do exactly that. And um, as you've heard already, lots of experience. That's the worst story I've heard so far. And in, in terms of like the scariest thing that we all fear and you're still in this industry. So, I mean, that's what I love about this industry is that, you know, you can persevere. So yes. what, what can you tell us, Stephen, about why you got into short-term rentals when you did, when really only VRBO was around? And I'm guessing you were probably using a lot of other different ways of managing and marketing your place. But what was the draw before even Airbnb was around for you? That's a great question. And, and our original business model and still still exists today around this, this effectively co-ownership. So it's it's basically you know a renting, but to a pool of co-owners versus using kind of the the you know the external platforms that it could exist and having um, people from outside your network in. So to to explain in 2006, uh, my wife was pregnant with our first uh, child, uh, first of two. His name uh, was born in February 24, so just a few couple weeks ago. His name's Cash, and at the time, I, our family loved travel. Like we. My wife and I said, no matter what, we're having children, we're going to continue to travel. We're going to break these kids in early so they know what airplanes, trains, and automobiles are all about. But travel obviously shifts, you know, when you have a child. The hotels are very are tricky. It's, it's obviously takes away some of the romantic charm of a hotel. And uh, so we thought, well, why don't we um, buy our own second home? Well, we didn't have any money. We're very early on in our careers. Um, so that was kind of not an option. But we also didn't want the restriction that existed when you have just one home. So then we thought about renting homes, which at the time VRBO was it. I mean, it was, right. I mean, the old term was I VRBO'd it. Well, now it's like our Airbnb. It. I mean, Airbnb certainly owned the branding space in the STR uh, industry now, but we didn't like the, um, the inconsistency as you, you know, all your followers would know there just was so inconsistent back then. Airbnb's added a tremendous amount of sophistication to get like consistency and familiarity on product to product, even with individual landlords. Back then it was like, thumb in the wind, you had no idea what you were getting. So we just basically created our own model inspired by some other things we saw in the industry. And we thought, wouldn't it be amazing to have a collection of private homes and uh, we could share them with a group of co-owners and effectively it's a, it's a closed loop um, of the rental. People that use them are the people in our family. And uh, so we went to 18 friends and family and uh, everyone, myself, my wife, my parents, and then 16 other families put in 200 grand each raised effectively three and a half million bucks. So we bought three properties, one in Maui, one in Phoenix, Arizona, or Scottsdale, and one in interior British Columbia, Western Canada, like a lake ski property. Nice. And those are our first three properties. And that was uh, 2007. And then it's it snowballed you know, uh, pretty significantly in the next six, seven years. And so what you're saying is you bought these properties essentially as second homes with everyone, but when you weren't using them, then you were renting them out. Uh, and, and at the same time, all three of you who bought these properties, or sorry, not all three, all three of the properties that you bought with this group, they were all able to use any of the properties at any time? 
Well, it's an interesting spin. We have done that absolutely, where we have the assets that we do, um, the, the co-owners and the equity participants take a little slice of time, we rent it out. That's probably where we really got proficient on the revenue management side on the Airbnb space, mostly with like luxury assets, Tuscany, Palm Springs, um, other hospitality assets. It was unique at the time because when we posed that out to the co-owners, everyone loved the idea of keeping it themselves all the time. So I think everyone assumed that we'd use this external time for revenue to go, you know, fill all the empty holes. Instead, the group was like, you know what, let's just make this a co-ownership vehicle. We'll pay all the costs. They don't have to rely on the outside revenue. And that became kind of, you know, the form of the funds that we ultimately grew to about hundred million in seven years and 50 properties, all in the one to $3 million space, kind of on the, called the mid-luxury side, luxury side. And, uh, and then at that point, we created this, this really good operational sophistication. And we have done some individual assets on the Airbnb side that take advantage of both that operational capacity and scale, but also, you know, the amazing platform that exists now that is Airbnb that's transformed the industry, made renting so much easier than it did back in the past. So it's kind of a hybrid model where our experience is really driven from scale of managing vacation homes, but in a kind of a closed loop setup. And then also now the last five years, I guess, six, seven years now renting out um, other portfolios of properties. That's very interesting. So mm -hmm. what, what were you doing before all of this that, that really, I mean, it sounds like you had <laughs> some sophisticated uh, investing experience. W were you in that arena before? Uh, you know what? It, uh, I don't want to say fake it till you make it, but at the time, I don't think I was that sophisticated. I was a young guy trying to like, I was super passionate though. Like I knew what I wanted I knew what our, and I just hoped other families would believe in me and believe in kind of the concept we painted. But the business I was in, I've always been an entrepreneur uh, my whole life. So I was in a family business at the time. It was actually grocery retail. So there was, a, we did learn about, you know, certainly complex logistical operations. So it certainly helped as you entered into um, a business of this kind of size. And so that's where I was beforehand. And then when this um, started, we eventually exited that business. And my wife and I, we went all in. My wife is actually a journalist for many years, so she was uh, part-time in the business, retired from that a few years ago, and now we're basically, you know, 100% all in on kind of growing this brand and, and um, adding, we have development projects now and fishing lodges, and we have lots of different kind of hospitality touch points as the arms have kind of carved off to different paths. That's cool. So you, you kind of already mentioned it, but, you know, you were just as Airbnb was kind of coming in, that, that really wasn't even a thing for you. So how did Airbnb impact your business and how have you seen it impact the industry since it came about back in 2008? Yeah, you know what? The interesting for us is our first experience is we owned a couple of places in uh, Manhattan, kind of right off Times Square. And it was before, uh, you know, coming out of the Great Recession and Airbnb was starting to become a thing. And, and you, I'm sure most of your followers know New York was kind of the first to implement you know, some of the call it anti Airbnb laws or anti STR laws because investors were buying up like entire vacant towers and renting them out and effectively turning them to hotels. So my first real impact with Airbnb was then in 2000, it might've been 11, I think. And uh, we were actually asked to leave a building. And even though our group was a bit different, but they said, you know, we have these new laws in place um, to prevent short-term rentals and your short-term renting. I said, well, it's actually a group of equity investors that are all kind of co-owning but, you know, the spirit of what we were doing was transient. You know, people are coming and going and enjoying it as a, as a lifestyle pad. Uh, so they, you know, the blanket law was effectively, if the spirit of your intent to use is under 30 days, you were thereby classified as, you know, a short-term renter. And so that was our first exit. We had to sell a property. And that was our first, like, wow, this actually, um, and then we had the same thing happen in Palm Springs, California. And then we're like, what are these Airbnb laws coming down the pipe? So that was the first, like, disruption. But the amazing part about it is like just the sophistication of creating like a consistency amongst brand that VRBO never had, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just think that's been like, and the technology platform is, you know, obviously untouched back then and still is at a whole league of its own. So it's been pretty amazing for the industry. So I guess I'm having a tough time understanding that because if you're an equity owner, you're not really renting it. So how come, <laughs> how come you were forced to, to, I mean, how is it that they didn't see that that wasn't the same thing, I guess, is what I'm having a tough time with. No, tr trust, we had a very tough time with it. We had, <laughs> we had lawyers and it was all very friendly, but it was, yeah. um, the, the difficult thing was, um, so we actually had two prices in there. One um, of the communities accepted us as kind of one of their own and said, no, we, you're good people equity owners, you're not accepting remuneration like on like an open platform for the, the revenues. And, um, but the other building was like, 
kind of, we were almost like a, an innocent bystander. There was lots of people renting and they had to clean house of both anyone doing short-term rentals. So they just went to the front desk and said, who are you giving keys to, you know, twice a week? <laughs> and that's how they identified us as potentially calling and falling in the same bucket. Mm. Legally, we probably could have pushed it and, um, and probably would have won based on the equity component. But we just kind of felt like if it's a place we're not really welcome, and that's, you know, certainly a really important thing. If you're not really welcome in the community, I'd rather be in a place where we're welcome, like where our clients and our owners and our eventual renters are all welcome to be. And otherwise, it just seems like you're just going to have difficult neighbors. And that's just not fun for your guests or you as a landlord. Yeah. So fast forward to today, you have, what, what does your portfolio look like? Is it now more of the OTAs like Airbnb, VRBO, or is it still more of the equity ownership like uh, you started off with? We have a mix. So our equity portfolio is down. We have the equity portfolio runs in these 10-year disposition events. So we just finished two effectively 20 to $30 million disposition events, which creates liquidity for exiting owners. So we're down to uh, 26 properties, I believe, and, and um, two funds ex- effectively. And all of our investment in time now, actually all of our investment, you know, um, that, because that group is capped and that has a 2025 event. So our job right now is just servicing the heck out of those co-owners, making sure they have an amazing experience. But we are, our development side is looking at the STR space is actually building STR purpose communities. And this is a really kind of important side. We have done this on the development side. So 2014, we saw the Airbnb thing coming and saw this regulation that was going to might have hit New York to start, but every lifestyle market in the world is going to have it if they don't already. So we started developing our own communities um, specifically that allow short-term rentals. So we actually have a heavy investment in that. And then in often cases, we will actually take over the management of the rentals for the people that buy in this community. So we're actually kind of filling the full vertical now, identifying the land, creating a vision for an STR community, selling them off. And then we actually will manage in some cases, the rental for the clients and generally Airbnb luxury retreats will be the platforms we'll be on, but we definitely participate in other platforms that fit, you know, there's local platforms in Tuscany, it's a whole different, you know, Airbnb is there certainly, but there's others as well that are quite good. So we'll spread it around the various, but we haven't been in the OTA space um, just based on the nature of the, the product, but it's nothing we're against. I think it's a great space to also list. Awesome. So uh, by the way, guys, we're here with Stephen Petaskey. He's with the Luxus Group coming out of Canada right now. And um, if, if you are listening or watching live right now, make sure you post your questions in the Facebook group on the comments right now. This is a even higher level than what we usually talk about. You know, we're <laughs> usually talking about, you know, hey, how'd you, how'd you start in like 2015 with your arbitrage or co-hosting business? And, <laughs> and, you know, like this is, this is definitely a different side of the business, which is what I really like. So um, Steven, going back to what you said there, I think that's super unique. So you're literally developing these communities, selling them off, and then even coming in essentially as a co-host or as a manager to be able to continue to make money. And that's that's really cool. I mean, this this is just really like, we talk a lot about, hey, become a realtor so that you can help these clients buy a property and then manage. But you're literally, hey, let me be the developer. <laughs> create the property, sell it, and then, and then manage. I mean, that's, that's creating a lot of different streams of income there. So it sounds yeah, like right. you kind of mentioned earlier, you've got a lot of different arms uh, yeah. that are bringing, you know, vertically integrating your business. Can you dive a little bit more into what other ways that you're creating income within your business? Yeah, for, for sure. And, and I think I just would say like, you know, hopefully, hopefully I'm an example or our company as of um, there's so many different ways to play in the sandbox. Like, uh, I think being an Airbnb host and getting in that business is like, I think that the trajectory we're on, and you're clearly onto this, Kyle, while you have such a great following, is like this. And I think like residential homes were post Great Recession when big, you know, groups and investment funds did not own like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of vacation or pardon me, residential homes till the Great Recession happened. We're starting to see a consolidation where big rental funds are entering the market. So your, your Airbnb host can beat the market you know, and by get ahead and potentially sell at a premium. If you have an asset, it could be one asset, it could be 50. Like it really comes down where if you're generating a rental in a, in a regulated space, that's allowed for STR in an effective way. That is worth something to some of these big players that are coming down the upstream right now. They're going to be chasing the smaller players. Um, they're looking, I think there's just, it's just such an awesome space. So that's what I think from a high level, from our perspective, uh, we have the development side, which has uh, been because we love it so much and we think there was a need or there is a need in the business. And as we develop more of these communities, 
we'll be targeting Airbnb hosts. Like, hey, you have a community that loves you. You have neighbors that love you. You're, you're fully regulated to be here. You'll never have to worry about getting kicked out. And we take care of a lot of the hassle. So you can just focus on filling your property. So we want to create that as a value add. Um, then the other side of the business would be some of the luxury hospitality side. So we have uh, restoration develop, uh, division in Italy and in central Tuscany. In all, all cases, effectively, we help Airbnb those properties out after they're, they're built, but they're very specific. It's like 20, 30,000 euros a week type experience. And it's been a lot of fun. Like, I mean, that was a learning curve for us in 2014. We got into that space because that type of clientele is looking for something, you know, a little more curated than, you know, a traditional just, you know, an Airbnb you know, stay. And I have a fishing lodge. That's more of a personal passion that we, uh, we acquired. And that is fully open rental. We do have uh, members in that as well, like a private club, but that's um, less about income and more about just a love for uh, being in the outdoors. That's really cool. Awesome, man. Um, so what does your team look like today? It sounds like there's a lot, because there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, what does your day-to-day -day look like and how are you able to accomplish that with the team that you have? Yeah, it, I think, especially if you go back to your first, I mean, remember 15 years ago, I, I you know, we brought these amazing families on with us, this, this, this ride with us, and we had no team. We committed a team. So what we committed back then was an asset manager and a concierge. And those are our first uh, two hires. It was the same person because we could only afford one at the time, but now the team's grown. So we have the asset management side, which looks after, and generally speaking, you know, you're as an Airbnb host, if you look after, you know, one, two, three, four properties, you're doing it yourself, but eventually you'll get to a point of scale that you want to hire your own asset managers, taking really good care of the property. So you're not getting bogged down in the minutia and you can focus on the sales side. And then we have a concierge team. We call them techs, but it's travel experience coordinator and a team of, uh, we're peaked at six or four right now, based on the resizing of the portfolio and their jobs to look after the clients. And so what I used to do maybe 14 years ago is they do on a daily basis right now. So they'll, um, client will make a booking to Hawaii they'll reach out and they say, what can I help you with? And I'd really like to book like a snorkel trip or, you know, give me a favorite restaurant or, Hey, there's an emergency, you know, where's the closest hospital? This, this is kind of on standby. So that would be in this office we have behind us here. We had about 20, about 20 people kind of on the payroll here that service the different divisions. Okay. And, and then, uh, and that includes some, uh, for some of the other, uh, uh, divisions we have, we have six in Italy and five in the U S but then we have a lot of contract people. So when you get to a certain size, relying on the ground, the people on the ground is so important. Like if you are, if you're a, an Airbnb host that's not in the market you live in or that you, you rent in, you need someone you really can trust. And that's, uh, they're not on payroll, but they're almost like permanent contract employees. And we have dozens of them based on around the world in each market. And uh, they're like, they're just so phenomenal. Like they're just the ones that make it happen on the ground. Yeah, you can't you can't do it without people like that, especially if you're going to be in a bunch of different markets, or even if you're in the market, you still need to have that person because you know yeah. you want to go out of town, you want to go on vacation, you just want to spend time with your family. You can't be the one. Correct, going. exactly. Yeah, I'm gonna have a light in my head. I'm gonna do a little light adjustment here. Oh, you're good. You're good. Uh, <laughs> all right, so Stephen, the whole reason that we're doing this video and and this podcast, especially live here in the Facebook group, is because people want to know what do you need to know as a first time vacation home buyer. Yeah. So, you know, just take us through really quickly. I'm, I have no idea what I want to buy. I have no idea if I even want to manage it myself. Maybe I'm going to hire someone else to manage it. I still haven't kind of figured that out. What should I be looking for? And maybe even where should I be looking? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, thinking of this question, I'll probably just go back to like 15 years ago. I think of the and, and the hindsight is obviously a wonderful gift. You can look at the, the decisions we made that weren't the right ones and the ones that worked out. But first off, uh, which I know is well covered in this, this group of yours, which is amazing, but is the STR regulation. Like you have to, people start looking in the wrong places because they, they start from their heart, which is I think a second or third point, but you got to start from where you can actually be. Right. And um, we just finished, I have one of my uh, team members in San Diego right now. And his mission is to understand every single Southern California coast city STR regulations, and, and if they're, they're not regulated yet, what the city council is talking about, where they're at. So having a really good understanding, because you can get burnt and you have to force sell or change. So that's number one. Number two, personally, and this is not necessarily for everyone, but I think try to pick something within a reasonable radius for you to access. So if it's, you know, call it a three, four hour car ride, you know, something, you know, obviously if it's down the street, it's even easier if you happen to live in a lifestyle destination already. In Edmonton, this isn't a vacation destination. So I couldn't, I wasn't, didn't have that opportunity. 
But if you're in San Diego, buy something in Carlsbad, you know, yeah. so you're close. And if, if crap hits the fan, you can dive in and help out and, and solve issues. Um, number three, I would say the setup process is, and I, I was, your website's great, you like giving people the tips on how to set up, but the, the setup process is so important mm. because it's, it's a lot of work, but the issue is, is like wear and tear is one, but just repeat experience. So if you're yeah. first time guests, which takes so much time to procure and get like the cost to acquire a client, which is usually your friends and family to start, but eventually you have to get it through these platforms is if they have an average experience because you cheaped out on linens or you didn't have the turkey baster for, for Thanksgiving or some of these things, they're just going to get annoyed and possibly go somewhere else. But if you really dial it in, it's like immaterial amount of cost for a proper setup. And I'd be happy to offer um, anyone in your show. We have a whole list that we do, like we've kind of curated over the years. It's like Hankle number two knives, you know, this amount of this type of salad bowl, like we'll give, we've learned a lot, these type of linens, we're happy to help out anyone on your cool. list. We'll provide a contact for you. So just, just ping me directly if you're interested. But the, the most important I would say in your first time, and I'm a big believer in this one, I'm pretty uh, outspoken is like, buy something you actually want to stay in yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really hard if you be like, oh, I'm told, you know, like, you know, Corpus Christi is great in the summer or something like that. Or do you want, do you want to go there yourself? Like, do you love it? Because if you don't want to go there yourself, it's kind of like, it's really hard to sell it, you know, especially to your, your circle of friends to get it going. So I always pick Maui, Scottsdale and Interior BC were my three, three favorite family destinations. We chose those because I know worst case scenario, if the world shut down, at least I have places I want to go to. Yeah. So that would be my, my, you know, the most important tip for your first and second homes. That's great. So, you know, one of the things that people are always coming to me and saying is, I, I want to get into short-term rentals. I want to get into Airbnb because I want to either own arbitrage or co-host a bunch of different places in a bunch of different areas that I want to go vacation in. Yeah. So you just mentioned three. Yeah. So if you were to go back and do it all over again, would you buy in those three areas again, or would you buy three homes in one of those areas? That, like the, be the best question, I'm glad you brought it up because there's scale of two levels. There's like scale at you know, our level, like where we have had 50 properties, but in like 35 different destinations or their scale in a certain market. If you're really thinking like um, an idea of, of revenue management, operational cost efficiencies, 100% singular destination. Yeah. You just can do so much better by saying, by three places all in the same block or in the same city with maybe slightly different experiences. I, I'll, I will admit we made mistakes and it's very hard to manage multiple places and multiple different destinations. They all have their own cost structures, challenges, idiosyncrasies, STR laws, it's a lot to keep up on. So if you're going to start with a few, I think scale on a destination is a, a, a more, uh, you'll make your life a lot easier, I promise. And you'll probably do financially a lot better off as well. I love it. Yeah. And I, I think what you said there, though, you know, you can start there and then you can go to those other areas yeah. that, but again, it, it does come down to your goals. Like if, if it's just a revenue play then yeah absolutely but if it's like a lifestyle play then i think you know go and get those three places in three different areas i just think that it's yeah. going to be more headache for you to manage three different sets of teams in three different areas so i can attest fully i know the house yeah. i think we peaked at 35 destinations around the world like different wow. spots and um i mean we have such a good team i'm so grateful because they've just got such great SOPs that are, are very universal for most setups, but it's retraining a manager in each destination on your specific protocols. And so it's, it's honestly hard to scale that way. It's why there's no one really out there that's been able to scale with their wholly owned portfolio mm -hmm. in 30 destinations. It's usually there's guys that own clusters. Like I own, you know, this beach city in San Diego, I have 30 homes. Like that's where guys have seen a lot of financial success, but you can't live in 30 different homes. So like it's, uh, it's it does come to where, what it means to you personally. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question here from Josh. He says, is there a limit for vacation home mortgages? Do you know? No, we've, uh, it's a great question. I, uh, from Canada, um, our financing structure in the U S is like almost non-existent. So I was unable to do it. Now, if I would buy in Canada, it's pretty, it's usually pretty clear. 65% usually in a second home, maybe 70%. You don't get the 80, 90s that maybe, you know, the subprime days, the 105s <laughs> percentages. But as I understand, you know, from the US side, that's probably not far off from 65 to 80 in terms of like a lever rate. But everyone has, depends on if it's just security in the home, is it, are you using some personal security to back it up? And, and you're probably your relationship with your banker. But generally, um, 
we bought our stuff on cash again because it's been a different model our right. rental properties usually are at 60 percent so that's kind of a safe play if there's a market reset you've got some wiggle room you're not going to be underwater so that kind of brings up another question for me when when you've got these you know we're kind of going away from from the topic here but i do think that this brings up a good question how are you underwriting these deals when you're bringing in multiple partners yeah, great point. It's um, we've got a really good underwriting team. I, I met like early stage. It was me on an Excel sheet, just like plugging numbers and like you know you do the data search on you know VRBO at the time, and numbers were all over the map because there was no real like uh, guidelines. Um, now we've got a team like an analyst that's basically full time, two people really, and their job is like when they underwrite a certain market and a property within that market, they bring a lot of information in. A lot of it though is still the old school. I don't trust the. Um, the, the, the AI platforms out there that are producing the, the, um, the data that you can pull the air DNAs and things, not that it's all bad, um, but I we usually start with the baseline from those areas. And then we will actually just do the old fashioned work, go online, pull comps from all the different markets or all the different areas, different homes within that, get as close as we can, spreadsheet it out, take a lot of averages. We'll go through count how many days are booked in each property. Like it, it does take a little bit of elbow grease to kind of like go through and do it. But we probably end up with better data than most people for when we make a decision, we can inform our clients to say, hey, I think that 58% is a more reasonable occupancy than 68%. And I think an ADR of 325 a night is more reasonable than 375 a night. Mm -hmm. Here's our factors. But we're still pushing for 68% occupancy and a 400 ADR. So it's definitely uh, helps. But um, the one-off basis, once you have the data on the market, it's, it's pretty like you can replicate it. But mm -hmm. when you enter a market, that's what I do. Cool. So let let's let me i'm sure you've had plenty of hacks that you've learned across the the board during your years if i already own a house yep. and i want to go and buy that second home that's in that destination let, let's talk about maybe some of the the financial hacks that i can look into whether okay. it's the mortgage how i buy it what the advantages are of being able to bring in someone else to help me buy it like if there were to be maybe to just like two or three hacks for me wanting to save money and buy in the best place. What are some of those hacks that you would recommend to people right now? Great question. I think right now is a lot of people, I mean, it's the seller's market, right? It's if you're buying in today's market, which is, I'm not gonna say overpriced because no one has a crystal ball to know how much higher it's gonna be. It's higher than it was last year, certainly, but that's not, not to say it's still not a great investment is um, I'd say that number one is you need a great agent. Like you need someone who like truly understands the market. Most agents, I don't say think they're great. I don't mean in a rude way at all, but they're not STR specialists. They're residents, residential specialists. So like may not be a hack, but just a tip in the sense that like we do a lot of called underwriting and interviewing on to ensure when we enter a market, we're like we're entering Austin right now, Austin, Texas to look at opportunities. We've been through half a dozen agents to try to find, we finally found the right one that really understands STR because they're the ones that will know and can door knock and shake trees to find you a deal. So you don't have to be the guy in line bidding like the sixth bid in when something hits the market in 24 hours. So I'd say that's probably number one. Number two is have your financing organized before. And I think that most people know this now, but almost any offers subject to financing are being turned away because the sellers, they hold the dice right now. So if you right. can take a line of credit on your personal house and have the cash in pocket, and you can walk in and say, here's a, you know, a check and I'm going to take it. Um, then your, your odds of getting that property are much better. And then you refinance it after. So that will be another way to ensure you're getting the deal. So those will be a couple ideas in getting it. Once you have it, there's lots of different ways. Like you can bring partners in. Oh yeah. I have some friends that are now doing it where they're actually, they're keeping the equity, but they have a proven model of delivering a certain kind of cap rate on their Let's just say they're making 14%, you know, return cash on cash. They'll go to friends and get a, a secured note or effectively a private mortgage, give them eight or 9%, pay it off, you know, in five, six years after refi and appreciation. And now they own it wholly and they, they're delta, like they're spread right out of the gate. So it's a little financial engineering, but like kind of that spread is a lot narrower in your first four, five, six years, but you don't have to share the equity with someone. Yeah. So it. I haven't done that, but I've watched these guys do it. I want to understand it because they are like really good at it. And now they own this massive portfolio. And I'm interested. Some people just don't want the equity. I'll take a 9% or 8% note. And if you're, if you can prove you can deliver better cash and cash returns than 9%, you're going to be ahead of the game. So those are all a few things I think of. Uh, I'm seeing the market now and guys are making a lot of money on, on either side of it. Yeah. I, there was one deal that I did 
in 2020, right before COVID hit, um, I was able to use a conventional 5% down loan because I was going to live in it. it, had multiple units, got an investor to pay for the mortgage. There was a little bit of uh, renovations plus the furniture, yeah. lived in it for free because they, you know, the, the, uh, the renters were essentially paying the mortgage. I was paying a private note to him for the furniture and he was an equity owner in the beginning. But then we had after two years, the opportunity to be able to refinance him out, refine him off the deal. Uh, he got all his money back plus interest, crazy amount of interest. I think in like two years, he made like somewhere around a 70 or 80% return. It was crazy. And then <laughs> I was able to still, even with the cash out refinance, put another $20,000 in my pocket. And now I own a house flat out and with no, no one else on it. So yeah, there's, there's some of those, you, if you find that kind of deal and can think outside the box a little bit and think creatively and just you know, know your numbers, right? Totally. You like, that's exactly what a lot of guys are doing right now. And I think if um, we're not in that specific kind of space, but as I'm starting to see it, I'm thinking I, I might put some money and in invest, co-invest with some guys who are doing this because I'm, it's very, very smart. It's very genius. And you just have to, you can think of, there's again, lots of ways to, to make money in this space. And that just happens to be another one. And I, I love the idea. You, you Everyone's a winner in those deals. So, and there's, it's all on YouTube, like your channel and others yeah. provide the, the hacks here to basically, that's not, doesn't have to be the typical way of buy it with all your own cash and have to do everything yourself. There's ways to partner up with these deals that can make you accelerate your growth a lot quicker than I had to. It was really slow to start. Absolutely. Guys, we got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I see a question from Joe. I'm going to ask that here, but please post your questions. We are wrapping up here with Stephen Petaskey of the Luxus Group, not the Lexus Group, the Luxus Group. <laughs> yes. And uh, Joe asks you, Stephen, uh, what questions do you ask new agents to gauge their knowledge of STRs? Great, great question. It's actually something we've just recently launched with that. Uh, an arm is as we're trying to share with you, Kyle, but just for everyone benefit, I've not been on social media in 15 years. We haven't done any of this. This is new for me, but we feel like there's a, there's an opportunity to give this knowledge out. And um, we started a YouTube channel. We can come back to it later, but then my number one thing I'd beat on every single time on every single show is picking a great agent. How to do it is a great question. So sometimes I'll go look at um, the communities that I want to be in. Like so I'll go on Airbnb, let's say, and short-term rentals, Austin. It, and usually regulated spaces, you're going to be you know, in very specific areas. And I'll see if there's any common realtors, realtors that are actually representing multiple properties in that space. Mm. It's usually a good initial thing. So you don't have to like have too much brain damage going through um, you know, Google to try to figure out who the best person is. I'll call that person first and then understand my question number one, how many of your listings and the deals you do are in the SDR space versus re residential space? Mm. There's almost no one who's 100% in STR unless they're like in a complete, complete vacation destination. Um, the majority will be, you know, 90% residential, 10% STR. But if you can find someone who's doing like half their deals in STR space, you would consider them likely proficient, you know? So that would be probably number one is to make sure they're actually, because they'll all say, oh, 100%, I know, I know, I know, I know. They don't like it's it's this it's a lot of information. A lot of people just don't have deals in these markets to do. So number one, that, and then number two, um, I, because if they have a concentration, so how many deals you do, the next thing would be like, how many deals would you have like off market? Because they're the type to say, okay, well, there's two properties on market, but I just closed six deals in the last year. I could call one of the previous clients and get you in on that deal. So that's why I think like just being in the space, um, as an agent, uh, and first of all, if you are an agent, get proficient with STR, you will crush the business. So yeah. you're an agent on the show, hundred percent. I'm looking for people like you that know the space. But if you're a buyer, I would just quiz them on the amount of info. And sometimes they haven't done it, but they're hustlers and they're ready to learn. And that's okay too. I'm totally down with that. And I'll just tell you too, just to add to what you said there, Stephen, if you are a realtor and you can become proficient in SCRs, then you're going to have people like me when someone says, hey, where should I buy an Airbnb? And I tell them that area, I'm going to connect them with you, Mr. and Mrs. Realtor, because I don't want to be the one that is evaluating properties for your clients all day long so that you can put in offers like that's, that's so much work on our end. So if I can, yeah. if you can learn that so that when I give you a client, 
And then I give you another client and I give you another client and you find the properties and then we're just taking it on as management. I don't have to underwrite all these every single time you even want to put in one offer, then, then you and I are going to be best friends. So <laughs> I, I love it. Maybe just a spin on that as well. That's kind of what the YouTube channel. It's like, we're here to connect. So if you're an agent that's in the space or wants to be in the space in a lifestyle market, reach out to me um, through the YouTube channel. You'll see advice at Luxus Group because we are looking to build our, our agent network of people we trust in this space. And if you're a buyer, use us because we have building this, this space of you know, dozens and dozens and soon to be hundreds around the world. If you want to enter a market, we've done most of the pre-work for you. So just feel free to call us. We'll refer you in to two or three people. You pick who's best for you in that market, like who's a good culture fit. And um, that's kind of the value add we're trying to create through this whole YouTube channel and free education. Very nice. Very nice. Again, Great. guys, his YouTube channel is Luxus Group. So L-U-X-U-S. Just search that on YouTube. And you can go ahead and uh, subscribe, hit the notification bell too. I know Steven's wanting some subscribers just got this launch, what, like eight weeks ago, you said? Yeah, just started. It was a soft launch to see like you know, who would jump in. And you know, my mom, she jumped in real quick. It was <laughs> awesome. I, had, I got all my staff. They had to do it. So I got to like 20 quick. And then there you go. we're officially launching now. We'll call this the official launch. So it would mean the go. world to me if, you, if any of your viewers would subscribe. And I cool. promise there'll be some nuggets of value on that channel. Perfect. That, I love it. I love it. All right. I've got one hard hitting question for you before we start sure. to wrap up here. And guys, here's your last chance. If you're watching live, post your question before we wrap up. What do you think of arbitrage? You know what? I'm To be honest, I, I can't give you an informed answer on that because it's only a space I'm just starting to learn now. I have a yeah. friend that's heavy, heavy into it. And we okay. literally have a call set up next week too. He's like, I'm like, I need you to dumb it down for me and explain it. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think of arbitrage? Well, because it's something I, I actually don't have enough information on to give uh, an actually educated answer. Yeah, no, I mean, that that's where I started. So, you know, there's, <laughs> I guess the reason I asked you that question is because there's a lot of people that have been in the business for a while that are, you know, either fans or completely hate it. And so that's why I want to ask that question. But yeah, I mean, you know, what a great, what a great world we live in though. And that's why I love this business is, you know, you've just provided us with some ways that we can go and own properties with creative means and partners and just what an amazing business model that you've created. You know, let's be honest, most people are not going to do what you've done. 99.9% .9 of people are not going to even be able to picture doing what you've done. <laughs> Thank you. But it, well, yeah. And, and, and that's because you've, you've been super sophisticated at this, but the average person can go and talk to a landlord and tell them all the advantages of doing an Airbnb or short-term rental instead of a long-term tenant, especially with everything going on in New mm -hmm. York and California with moratoriums and, and all that yeah. stuff right now. And with yeah. all the stuff that's happened over the last two years, uh, it, it just seems like a no brainer to do short term rentals. And that's what creates such an opportunity for a normal, average everyday person to go out and create a potential six figure business and, and you can't say that about too many industries these days. I would say just like as a, as a wrap up to that or follow up as I start with one like people think or they might hear these stories. I remember I started with three but it, I, I brought an equity partners so were able to do three but really it's like to start with one. And if you are looking to build scale, you know, we talked about it earlier, but build within a certain market, there will be people like us looking to buy you, like groups like that, that have sophistication, they own a market, but start with one. You can make real money immediately by buying one. So I, I, I'm, I love the space. I love it. And I think there's so much potential, especially the pandemic accelerated the use of STRs and just got to be smart with it. But you can make money on day one. And that's what makes it pretty special. That's awesome. I, I was just about to ask you, what would you like to say before you, we log off here? But I mean, that sounds like pretty good advice. Anything else before uh, we do say goodbye? No, you know what? Just, just thank you very much. I mean, again, if uh, the YouTube channel would be great for me as we're trying to get the word out, it means, you know, it truly means the world to us. And thank you, Kyle, for doing what you're doing in the space. And we need educators, people providing value because um, gosh, white 15 years ago, didn't even exist the people that specialize in it, you made a massive impact on a lot of people's lives to make six and seven figure income. So thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Steven, thanks so much for jumping on and helping our audience to conquer the world of Airbnb. We appreciate <laughs> you.